So uh, next we have uh, Brad uh, Siskovich. He's from uh, Massimo. He's going to be handling the uh, concentrator photovoltaic. So we'll hand over. Uh, that's very good. So um, we're uh, we're all excited, and uh, it's been a, been a pleasure working with your group. I think you got a you got a superb team, and uh, we're looking forward to getting this thing out in the field. And probably won't give you the first press conference, maybe the second. <laughs> Thanks, Randy. Uh, as Randy mentioned, my name is Brad Siskavich from Massimo Semiconductor. Um, we're, we've been under contract, uh, known Randy for a while, uh, but been under contract uh, for a few months now to develop uh, both the custom cell as well as the uh, uh, interface to uh, the cell, which means cooling and uh, electrical uh, pulling both heat and uh, electrical out of the system. Uh, first, a little bit of, hey, something happened there. A um, little bit of um, background on Massimo Semiconductor. Uh, Massimo Semiconductor is actually a wholly owned subsidiary of a company called Massimo Corp. And anybody who's uh, been to the hospital and had that thing on your finger, um, that's actually uh, Massimo's main product line. So you may wonder why a biotech company is in PV. Uh, but as it turned out, we actually make uh, four different product lines, LEDs, lasers, uh, photodetectors, and photovoltaics. And we've had a 30-year a history in photovoltaics. Um, so for a parent company, we actually make LEDs and uh, photodetectors. But for uh, all other markets, um, defense, uh, energy industry, we offer other products, uh, including PV. And uh, we're excited. Um, about Randy's potential opportunity because we've had a long history, uh, 30 years or so, in the PV space. In fact, um, before Massimo purchased us, we were a company called Spire Semiconductor. And I can find the laser here. So in the late uh, 80s, we actually were one of the first companies to make multi junction PV cells for space based applications. So uh, this is a chart from National Renewable Energy Labs of uh, most efficient PV cells uh, in an R&D atmosphere. So the same team that's designing the cell for Randy uh, was on top of the world here. And then once again here um, in 2010, we actually created a 42.5% efficient PV cell uh, based on the sun spectrum. So um, we had high hopes for that. But uh, there's two issues that, that keep coming up with this big uh, red ball and it's that the uh, earth won't stop moving so it keeps going away. <laughs> uh, that's that's uh, one issue. Um, the other issue is it's uh, a long, long ways away from where we want it to be, right? So Randy solved both of those problems with his sun cell um, and we're excited about this opportunity. Um, and, uh, but we also are taking a cautious approach on how we implement the uh, PV. As Rainey mentioned, uh, the current design will function around 3,000 Kelvin. Now that's quite a bit different than the sun at 5,600 Kelvin. So we've got to tailor the cells to actually match that spectrum uh, of input light. So this is um, an overview of the second generation design. So it's actually, uh, the last, the the last design that we had had a tungsten instead of um, graphite uh, top. It was also slightly smaller, so you can see um, w with a single junction cell that actually captures uh, a large portion of the spectrum at 3,000 K of tungsten. Um, we're expecting about 11% efficiency, and the reason we're doing that is. Um, that's a known cell. It's understood. It works as something that we commercially uh, sell now. So we'll start with that uh, simple baseline. And once we put that cell above or around this device, it's a very known quantity. We'll be able to tell for certain, you know, with all the validation reports, there's nothing better than saying, here, we're actually making energy from this cell, from this spectrum. So if it lights up, we're going to grab that. And then uh, the plan is to actually move to multiple junction cells. And as Randy mentioned earlier, uh, so you have single junction cells out there, single junction silicon cells, 11%, uh, somewhere in that range. 
there's a big difference between 11% and 42.5%, and the reason is we actually stack multiple junctions on top of each other in the fabrication process, and that's what allows the much higher efficiency. So the second step to this uh, process is actually to make a two-junction cell, and you can see the efficiency double uh, out of the box. So with no additional real estate, no additional parts, no additional materials, uh, we change from one junction to two junction and double the efficiency. So this is, this is the uh, interim pilot target of roughly 20%. Um, uh, on the last gen, it would, it would create um, 28 and a half kilowatts. With a new graphite, um, uh, graphite actually has a different emissivity than tungsten. So the emissivity of tungsten is about 0.4. Uh, for the current models that we have. Graphite's going to be much closer to one, so that means you get nearly double the power out from a graphite than a, a uh, tungsten uh, lamp. And the other thing is it's, it's slightly uh, larger. So with a two-junction cell um, at 3,000 K with this copper one, we can see this being over 50 kilowatts. Uh, so you know, the goal here is actually a um, pilot-ready system, two junctions at 50 kilowatts, and the other thing that Randy hasn't talked about, which I'll throw it out there anyways, but if we're able to drive this above 3,000 uh, K, so up to 3,500 K, which is in and around where we were trying to operate the tungsten lamp, we actually are able to capture a lot more energy uh, from that device. The spectrum shifts shorter and more energy comes out of it. So we can see this, even with just the two junction cell, um, current design graphite, at over 100 kilowatts uh, for sort of pilot level uh, production. So that's, um, that's our goal in the short term. Um, as you may uh, recall from uh, Randy's uh, presentations, basically we're, we're building the Epcot Center uh, over top of or around this um, light bulb. And so what that means is we've got a lot of uh, different triangles. It's called the geodesic dome. Uh, so uh, this triangle will actually be a base unit, and we've made it a modular base unit so we can automatically switch from single junction up to two junction without changing anything else in the design. So that it's an automatic drop-in replacement to give us twice as much energy out of the device. Um, currently, it's, it's uh, 209 cells. These cells are actually tiled on top of this uh, triangle. The triangle has multiple layers um, underneath the uh, cells themselves are actually uh, what's called microchannel coolers. Uh, which pulls, there's going to be a significant amount of heat that has to be pulled out of the back. It's not actually converted into electricity. So that's one of the bigger challenges is to how to handle this heat. And we've, we've got a lot of experience in the CPV world on this type of design. Um, so currently, um, for this first iteration, we're actually going with a known and proven uh, copper microchannel cooler uh, that we've used in prior CPV um, systems so that you know, the goal here is to make sure we're, we're, we have the greatest uh, probability of success uh, in the first iteration. And then as John uh, referenced a couple different times, build upon that, uh, improve both efficiency um, as well as cost. But that's more of a down the road. The first thing we want to do is get this system wrapped around the, the sun cell and have it not tear itself apart. Uh, here's just a blow up of uh, the individual cells themselves currently um, we're under contract to develop the cells. These cells should actually be um, delivered in uh, November time frame, so they'll be ready for us to mount into the, the rest of the system uh, starting sort of November and beyond, and our hopes is that uh, by early January we'll actually be able to deliver the first, uh, the first TRU um, so that we can put it on top of John's system, run it, and see how much energy we're truly collecting. Um, these are, to Randy's earlier point, um, these aren't quite off the shelf cells, but this is a wafer, a CP wafer, a CPV wafer that we make um, fairly often. There's nothing in here that is really any different. So from a science standpoint, the science has been done. Um, it's much more of an engineering effort tailoring that to match what uh, Randy and his team are able to put out. So. Um, this is something that we can make, we can uh, put out about uh, 25,000 of these wafers a year under current capacity. Um, that, that, you know, given the other uh, numbers that we consider, that's probably a, about 1,000 uh, domes worth uh, per year of capacity. So we're in the 
uh, short to medium term, we don't really see any issues on the capacity side um, for what Randy's uh, and CT are trying to do. Um, here's just a, a table of, that further explains the uh, efficiencies that we can expect. The reason I have this table up here is, is uh, Randy's often uh, beating me up on cost and some of the, <laughs> so uh, some of the challenges with the, the cost of the current cells is that they're actually based upon uh, an indium phosphide substrate. And indium phosphide is used uh, fairly often in uh, telecommunications lasers. Um, they're out there and there are a lot of products on it, but it's, it's nowhere near um, as large scale as gallium arsenide based wafers, um, which are, are significantly less, one tenth the cost, the input cost. So the reason for that is every one of you are holding a phone, you're probably holding 10 different gallium arsenide based chips inside of that. So when the volume shows up, uh, in the end products, the, the uh, cost of these devices can come down. So uh, in the short term, the cells are expensive because of the fact that, largely because of the fact that they're running on this, this uh, other substrate. And, and there are reasons for that. Physics isn't all that kind. But the current program that we have with Randy is actually to grow uh, these devices on both uh, a gallium arsenide and an indium phosphide based substrate. Um, the gallium arsenide will be significantly more lattice mismatched, uh, meaning uh, they don't fit as well together, but the performance drop may actually be worthwhile uh, from a cost standpoint in the long term. So it's something that uh, he's had us investigate uh, currently, and those results will come out uh, in you know, the next month or so. Um, here's a, uh, the timeline that I've uh, proposed um, and actually is, is underway. So. Uh, we finished up the, the first design, which was basically just a model um, uh, of the initial geodesic dome. Uh, uh, phase two is actually to develop the cells. That's currently underway, and uh, we just recently uh, kicked off the um, phase three, which is to make the first uh, geodesic dome array. Um, I have some show and tell <laughs> of the, uh, the actual uh, Initial design, uh, just a mock-up prototype of the uh, receiver, the triangle itself. Um, we'll, so in phase three, um, we've also started a uh, modeling effort. So we're modeling uh, both uh, CFD um, heat and flow to make sure that all the calculations and all the engineering that we've done to this point are uh, bared out by the model. Um, we're also doing uh, ray trace, which is actually looking at uh, every one of the photons, um, at what angle they're emitted, um, at what wavelength they are, and where they go. So uh, as uh, Rainey also mentioned before, uh, there'll be some photon recycling. We can only absorb a certain amount of that spectrum. The rest of it will be reflected back to the dome. Um, and so that modeling effort is to, to allow us to understand how efficient we may be able to become by uh, rejecting the photons that we cannot absorb and turn into electricity back to the sun cell itself. Um, so all of those are uh, ongoing efforts and our schedule will actually match quite well with John and his team. Uh, we expect to deliver the first uh, TRU uh, early January, uh, the full uh, GDRA within a few weeks after that. So we'll actually be able to uh, put it on sun, test it, understand uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the design itself, and then uh, move from there. Um, the, the, the following steps are to develop, uh, create the two-junction cell, and then integrate again into a, a second prototype uh, that will hopefully allow us to see that, that large bump in efficiency and output um, within the sort of three-month uh, time frame after that. So by end of uh, Q2, we hopefully will, so roughly six months away, um, we'll see a uh, two-junction uh, full uh, GDRA that is able to put out power at around 20% efficiency. So. Is that if Randy gives you the contract? No, actually, so he's given me, well, so we don't have the two-junction uh, cell contract yet, but he actually, so we are making the one-junction cells in the, um, the first GDRA. So, yeah, that, that one will depend upon an additional contract, but, uh, and, that's kind of all I have. I'll, I'll take some questions, but this is, uh, these are actually some examples of prior um, 
dense receiver arrays that we've made for uh, solar-based projects. So to give you an idea, this, uh, um, this is roughly 4 inches by 20 inches, uh, and that was, uh, we generated 17 kilowatts uh, out of that. So that was uh, at 1,000 sun, um, 100 watts per square centimeter input. Now Randy's trying to get us to double that. So, um, you know, he's, he's pushing the envelope, but where we're starting right now is, is uh, very close to or on par with the energy input uh, that we saw in this uh, CPV system. So we're, we're quite confident that we'll get something, you know, first iteration that works. And, and from there, it's just determining, okay, how well did it work? What were the other issues and how do we improve it? So Question. That, I'll take questions. Yeah. Uh, what is the inside diameter of the dome? Uh, so it changes. <laughs> um, for this one, uh, so it was 210 millimeter radius on the, uh, the dome that was based on the tungsten. Uh, so we go back. I don't know if I put the... Yeah, so right there, uh, this one was, um, that's the radius. Uh, so roughly seven and a half inches. Um, now this was Gen 2. Um, moving to the carbon, we actually, the um, dome itself has increased about an inch. Um, uh, that, larger. That's the emitter dimension. My question was the uh, the optical receiver diameter. Uh, they're almost they're almost concentric. Yeah, it's, oh, really? uh, I forget. It's it's uh, so there's there's well there's conversations that have to be had, but this uh, is actually uh, the killer for us. So it's uh, roughly um, a centimeter outside of the flange. Um, so and I don't remember off the top of my head what that um, input area is, but uh, the closer we can get from our standpoint, the better from uh, the, the, an energy uh, flux standpoint. So, um, you know, we'd like to have that as close as possible just to make sure that we have as much uh, energy on the cells uh, as can be. The challenge is, is uh, you know, getting a, you know, the, there's engineering constraints as far as, you know, making this dome so that it's removable, replaceable, and, and at the end of the day, if Randy's got enough energy, that won't, act, you know, that extra uh, centimeter of, of diameter won't make a whole lot of difference. I have a question for you. Uh, as you develop oh, this, <laughs> hi, yeah, ghost voice. As you develop this technology, will you be developing proprietary patentable technology along the way? Uh, because the reason I ask is you stated that your capacity is 1,000 units. And so that doesn't seem nearly enough. And so sure, just sure. wondering about your plans going forward. If you have proprietary technology over this, what's the long-term game plan? Sure. So the, uh, the patents are everything is owned by uh, Brilliant Light. And anything that is patentable is basically use space case or uh, specific to their device, right? So uh, one junction, two junction, three junction uh, PV cells have been around for 25 years. Any patents that actually showed up, uh, many of which were, were uh, filed by NREL themselves, are off patent. Um, so there's, there's not really anything um, internal to the cell itself uh, that is patentable. What is where the field uh, of IP that currently exists is how Randy takes that specific cell and implements it into his uh, particular devices. And there's a lot of room there, and he's, he and his team are working uh, diligently on addressing all those factors. So um, in regard to the capacity, that's current capacity, right? So we've got uh, a lot of room to expand, um, but you know, those expansion plans have to be uh, tied very closely to um, the feasibility of those projects moving forward. So um, we can certainly address that uh, when that happens. Inside of our current building, uh, with actually just additional CapEx, we can double that capacity in, in six months to a year. So um, there's a lot of ways to move forward with this, um, but you know, we have to make sure that the use case bears out that, uh, those projections. Thank you. So, oddly enough, the more intensity uh, you have, uh, the more efficient the cells can get, assuming that you can pull the heat out of the bag, right? So, as uh, the cells operate at a higher 
temperature, the efficiency goes down, but as you put more light onto the cell, the efficiency actually goes up. So uh, that's what we do is we, we balance those two things. In the, so in the first design that we did uh, with this prototype, we saw about a 30 degree Celsius uh, increase in junction temperature over ambient. Uh, the second design, uh, which was a bit smaller, the flux was not quite as large. Uh, we were at about a seven and a half uh, degree Celsius increase over ambient. Um, this one, which the, the, the new design with the graphite, slightly larger, uh, higher flux, will be um, somewhere in the 10 degrees Celsius range. So um, on a single junction cell, you, uh, you will lose about 0.02% efficiency per degree C increase. So you won't have a, a large impact from temperature uh, on, on the cell itself um, in regard to efficiency. In fact, um, if you go back, oops. so what you'll notice is this is at 20.9% uh, uh, and that's actual operating temperature efficiency, whereas operating at 25C, uh, the design optimally should actually be at 21.6. So you can see the fall off from the increase in temperature, uh, operating temperature of the cell itself, uh, which is, you know, a few percentage points. Does that answer your question? Thank sure. You. Okay. Any others? Very good. Thank you.